you for joining uh, this event, uh, the second event organized by the law department and in particular, Paula, thank you for this. Uh, my name is Karine and I'm in charge of alumni relation and professional networks. I work with the Clementine Pierre Feu, who is a first year student in MDEV taking care of the technical aspects of this event so far. Uh, I will not take much of your time, but just wanted to remind you that we have about 20,000 alumni spread all over the planet and more than 60 representations, so about 40 chapters and 20 ambassadors. Uh, we have recently virtually launched uh, two new chapters, one in Accra, Ghana, and uh, the other one in Cairo, Egypt. And mm -hmm. this is a unique and exceptional network. And we are here also to help you to get in touch with the right person for you, depending on your needs, could be research, could be job, etc. Uh, the Alumni Association gives a prize for the best thesis every year on a rotating basis. So just to let you know this year, it will be the law department. Uh, and the Alumni Association also raised scholarships and uh, the scholarship of this year from the alumni community was also given to a lawyer uh, this year and uh, he was online last time. He's not there at the moment, but still. Um, we also uh, organize events uh, and uh, either among alumni or with students. And next week we'll hold the first virtual uh, Geneva Roundtable Symposium on Emerging Challenges for Global Citizens. It will be on two days. And the second panel on Wednesday the 16th will be on international law with uh, Batram S. Brown, uh, who is professor of law at the Chicago College, Chicago Kent College of Law, and uh, Charles Norchi, who is the director of the Center for Oceans and Coastal Law at the University of Maine School of Law. So both are alumni. Uh, this panel will be moderated by uh, Andrea Bianchi. And uh, finally, there will be the alumni reunion on September 25th. So hopefully we'll be here physically at the new residence uh, of the students. So please save the date. And for those of you who can join, it will be a pleasure to welcome you back in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Clementine, it's up to you now, or can we take the floor and open the, 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 the round table? So uh, the, the recording is uh, proceeding right now, so you can start the event and uh, the round table. Okay, thank you very much and thank you, Karine and Clementine for helping us and thank you for our panelists and for students who managed to, to join us even though they had the exams. Um, Professor Burch and I will be moderating, but this is a very informal event for our students and will be reserved to our students only, perhaps. So I don't know whether or not it would be possible. And we will be starting, we have a and, and num five panelists today with us, and uh, they all represent a variety of uh, careers in NGOs and think tanks. Uh, they have graduated um, in different times from the Graduate Institute. Some of them have a master's degree only. Some of uh, some of uh, some others have also a PhD. So I think that, like with the first event, we managed to. to to convene uh, as panelists uh, a variety of groups uh, of alumni who have had already an impactful career in the uh, field, uh, chosen field. Uh, Gianluca, do you wish to say something in particular in this respect? No, we, we are, as, as you just recalled, last time we had a number of panelists from international organizations. And so uh, we want to show, in a way, uh, the, uh, the success, I want to say, of our alumni in different walks of life, and in particular in different professional areas that are relevant for international law, for international relations, and so on. So the uh, NGOs and think tanks uh, that are represented today cover a wide spectrum of, uh, of a professional uh, itineraries, if you want, from uh, Giorgia Linardi, who is very much on an operational basis, uh, traveling through the Mediterranean, uh, to other colleagues uh, working in think tanks and so on. So we have a really broad, broad variety of experiences, of exposures, 
of uh, of things that I myself am looking forward to to, to hearing. Um, and so I hope, as you said, even though uh, we have fewer students than than we thought you would, uh, I'm sure it would be very useful. And uh, it would be a resource that can be listened to later uh, through the recording. So I suggest that we open with the first round of questions uh, and uh, each of our panelists uh, uh, will be invited to explain in a few words. So what are their main responsibilities? And I would start with Lisbeth, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, you work as a senior policy advisor with the Economic Law and Policy Program International Institute for sustainable development. Could you describe for us, Lisbeth, what are your main responsibilities as a senior policy advisor? Sure, and thanks a lot for, for having me here. Thanks a lot for the invite. It's, uh, it's great to, to connect uh, to some current students at the Graduate Institute, so I'm really happy to do this. Um, my uh, job at uh, ISD, um, which I joined actually quite shortly after graduating uh, from uh, my Master in Development Studies, at the moment um, focuses quite a lot on providing advice to governments as well as to the private sector sometimes. Um, I work in the domain of sustainable infrastructure and sustainable public procurements. Uh, and my responsibilities at ISD, um, which is uh, actually also a Geneva-based uh, think tank, so I am still sitting uh, in the same uh, city, never left after graduating. Um, it, um, it has changed over the years from more focusing on, on research in specific uh, topics related to public procurement and infrastructure policies, governance uh, and laws towards uh, also uh, responsibilities related to fundraising, related to communications, uh, related to um, broadening the network of the organization uh, to, to increase our outreach and, and impact in this area. Uh, and I think um, it is quite uh, common in the NGO think tank space that your responsibilities do not remain solely focused on research around a specific topic, but re really encompass uh, many aspects of uh, the project cycle, as we as we say. Um, so perhaps I I leave it uh, at that for now, uh, just just very briefly, uh, but. As, uh, as you've been saying before, really happy to make this an informal discussion and take lots of questions on where I am currently. Thank you. So I continue. I pass the same question. I do. Don't look at the first round on the first question. Do you mind? And then you do the second round. So the sure. Thing go, go ahead, Ben. For Simena, Simena, I think yesterday that you were preparing the thesis. Uh, but indeed, some time has passed, and since then you have been working for Geneva Call, and for more than three years. And now you are the regional legal and policy coordinator for Geneva Call's Eurasia Unit. So very, very fast career in your selected field. Can you tell us what are what are your main responsibilities with Geneva Call? Sure, thank you so much, Paola. Um, it's it's really a great pleasure to participate and, and share a bit of my experience. Um, what has been my path, my career path, it has uh, been very, very quick, as Paola has mentioned. I have been quite fortunate. Um, and I have indeed had a variety of roles throughout these past three years and more, and three years and a half at Geneva Call, you know, starting from intern working up to positions as legal and policy coordinators for a whole region, as well as filling certain gaps as a head of program or acting head of mission in Ukraine and Afghanistan. So it has indeed been quite quick. The responsibility has been a lot. Um, but knowing a, a bit of this, uh, Geneva Call, if for those of you who don't know, we are an international NGO working towards promoting greater respect of humanitarian norms, IHL, International Humanitarian Law, Human Rights Law, in order to improve the protection of civilians while also supporting local communities and their efforts to enhance their own protection. So within this framework, my responsibilities as a legal and policy coordinator um, are, you know, versing around political security, legal and policy analysis and research. So I provide legal advice to my region um, on humanitarian norms for specific trainings, capacity building. 
Um, I support knowledge management around the region, uh, mainly they're learning the continuous learning process for the different staff that is operational. I analyze foreign policies of different countries where we work in, but also in countries that are quite influential in the country that we work in. So it's quite broad. Um, and I try to ensure, you know, the proper flow of information and communication with field teams on specific thematic and legal issues that may be arising with time. So, again, this entails a lot of legal research, producing, you know, guidance notes, internal memos for staff, um, you know, both within the region, but also staff at headquarters who represent and do advocacy work for us. Um, so. Also, as uh, Lisbeth has mentioned, uh, often when you work in an NGO, you don't only work on what your role, you know, mentions that you work on. We work on various other topics, um, which was for me quite surprising and quite enriching in the sense that I'm also required to do external representation and communication. Of course, write studies and articles for Geneva Call and other relevant journals. Uh, but also participate in conferences and seminars uh, discussing about some operational challenges that we have, some legal, you know, issues that we may identify in some contexts, but also in a more operational way, in a more, let's say, digestible way for different types of audience that are perhaps not as technical or not lawyers. So that has been one of the main challenges in trying to transpose, you know, very technical terms into more digestible terms for a variety of audiences to understand. And then I also support with, you know, monitoring uh, multi-country programs. I work a lot on supervising the, the preparation of armed non-state actor profiles, uh, country situation analysis, which we need to update as part of the project cycle. Um, and for which I know one of the alumni who is here, Romina, has been uh, interning with us. She interned with us specifically working on this task. So I'm very happy to see Romina here. Um, but also develop, you know, as an NGO, no funding is secure. So we need to do constant fundraising on a yearly basis. And this occupies a lot of our time. So fundraising is indeed one of my key responsibilities in order to continue, you know, sustaining the region and sustaining our projects. And of course, day to day administrative uh, aspects that one would consider that you would not do. But indeed, I do work in human resources. I do train staff. I do recruit. I do coaching. Um, so indeed, uh, it's it's very a multi -prong, multi pronged approach to legal and policy coordination, um, but indeed quite enriching. Simena, you have a normal 24 hours day, I guess. So I, I'm impressed by the variety of tasks and responsibilities. But also when I, when I, when I, I ne never thought that as a professor, I would have done so many other things uh, unrelated to research and, th and, and, and teaching. So I, I guess that's the same for any job. So next is Christophe and Christophe um, is a senior research fellow and strategic advisor on economic, social and cultural rights at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. And he has many other functions and responsibilities, but uh, I, if I'm not wrong, Christophe, could I, could I stop with this as your main role? Because you, you, you have different uh, hats and different, um, I don't know how to say it, different responsibilities, uh, but you work in as a um, researcher and uh, in think tanks, at least at the Geneva Academy since many years. Um, but you can say more perhaps about yourself because your CV is very long since he, we know we know each other since at least 10 years. Thanks. Thanks, Paola. Uh, yes, it's also a great pleasure to be with you uh, uh, today. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm, uh, I worked uh, in the last 20 years on the right to food. I will explain a bit more after. Um, but basically, I'm doing research, teaching, and uh, also uh, legal advice and advocacy with uh, the Human Rights Council in Geneva, treaty bodies, uh, special procedures of the Human Rights Council, uh, states, NGOs. Um, in the last 10 years, I've worked on the on promoting the rights of peasants um, uh, who represent 80% of those who are hungry in the in the world and 70% of those who are extremely poor in the world. 
and so we 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 supported their work and we 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 were quite successful because in 2018 the UN General Assembly adopted a, a declaration on the rights of peasants uh, in New York. It was first adopted by the Council in, in Geneva and then in New York. And uh, and so now since three years we are uh, supporting the implementation of the declaration. Um, yeah, so that's one one example. And so now we are trying to convince this to create a new special procedure of the Council on this uh, on this topic on these rights on the rights of peasants. To promote the, the implementation of the declaration. So that's, that's just one example. For example, with treaty bodies, there is a, as you may know, no, treaty bodies, they issue what is called general comments in which they define the state's uh, obligations and the rights. And so, for example, on the committee, committee on ESC rights, they are uh, elaborating a general comment on land. And so we are I'm providing advice on how to, to, to recognize the right to land uh, in this general comment of the committee on ESC rights. So that's just two examples. A uh, last example, I was a candidate supported by Switzerland uh, last year as a, to become one of the, to become a, the special rapporteur of the right to food of the UN. Uh, I will explain I, later. I worked for the first one uh, many years ago. And so I was second at the end. And uh, they, I mean, the, the one that was chosen is, is very good. So that's okay. But it's, uh, it's it was a first uh, a good experience to, to 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 lobby and to uh, to yeah to to have to to do some uh, presentation at the at the UN uh, to 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 fight for the right food and explain what I would do if I would be the special rapporteur. But you have been really a pioneer on many issues uh, uh, in Geneva, including not only the right to food, as you say, the right to of peasants and uh, all these connected stuff. I've been pioneering research, if I may say so. Um, so we will have time then to 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 to, to get also questions by by the students who are attending. Next uh, is Georgia, and Georgia, you, we see you. You are in Palermo, uh, and uh, Georgia graduated soon after graduation. She joined Sea um, Watch, uh, and she's now the spokesperson and legal advisor at Sea Watch, and uh, so she really. Us, um, I mean, you don't have boots on the ground, but you put your feet on water, uh, if I can say so, to do an important job, Georgia. Can you tell us what are your responsibilities? Thank you. Thank you, Paula, for, uh, for introducing me. And it's been already very interesting to hear also from my colleagues about their responsibilities and their uh, daily uh, uh, duties, uh, and I have to say, I uh, I see myself quite a lot uh, in uh, uh, um, Ximena in uh, in the sense that having started with Sea Watch uh, at the very beginning of the activity of the NGO, I ended up doing a little bit of everything. And but I have to say that this is also what uh, makes me continue after now almost uh, six years um, engaging in the in the field of uh, um, search and rescue at uh, sea. And my responsibilities indeed relate to uh, providing uh, legal advice to rescue operations, both at sea, but also uh, in the air, because at Sea Watch we also have, uh, we also carry out aerial monitoring missions. Um, and uh, um, it's interesting because I, what I learned is that uh, uh, there is a lot of, uh, uh, there is quite an effort to be done to combine, to balance uh, the legal background and the applicable legal framework with uh, the operational needs, uh, the, with humanitarian considerations, and uh, with uh, um, an increasingly hostile political context. Uh, so this is actually one of the aspects uh, that I find most uh, interesting when it comes to applying um, uh, the different uh, branches of international law and national law um, when it comes to Italy that um, connect to uh, search and rescue. And when it comes to my role as a spokesperson for Sea Watch in Italy, uh, Italy is the country where our operations have an impact because because uh, um, most of the people rescued by NGOs at sea are disembarked in Italy. So this is uh, and this is a country also where the topic is. Uh, um, uh, most uh, debated and quite um, divisive, I have to say. So, in my role as spokesperson, what I do is to um, uh, 
uh, defend, I have to say, the position of the organization, trying to explain to the public opinion what we uh, what we do, uh, interact with the institutions, uh, and uh, so I'm talking at political level, so with the um, uh, competent ministries, but also with the authorities at. Um, uh, military uh, military level because as you can imagine there is a lot of interaction of this type as well uh, when it comes to operations at sea um, and uh, as part of my role as spokesperson there is as, as well the um, duty to uh, relate uh, to, to 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 talk to the public opinion to the civil society uh, raise awareness about our activities to connect with the other NGOs uh, doing similar activities but also working on migration on uh, on land uh, shaping uh, the advocacy and uh, related communication strategy um, and uh, this is uh, yeah this is uh, this is related uh, to the work that I do a bit more on in, in the background uh, when it comes to providing legal advice and uh, um, uh, developing assessments, trying to adjust to the operational developments and uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, it's been very interesting lately to uh, interact uh, with uh, um, a group of experts of which uh, uh, Professor Paula Gaeta is part, which is the Right to, uh, to Rescue Committee, where we have the chance as NGOs to, um, uh, to, to liaise with different expertise, with the uh, international lawyers, international law professors, uh, prosecutors, Futures to receive uh, advice and feedback on uh, technical uh, questions related to our activities. So uh, this is also um, uh, this is also something in which I am uh, involved and which enriches a lot uh, our uh, our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgia. And uh, it is possible, likely, and I very much hope that uh, we will be able not to organize a law clinic uh, um, concerning uh, um, search and rescue operations at sea uh, as part of the curriculum of the master in international law next year. So let's hope that uh, we managed to, to add um, this to our curriculum. So last but not least, the one Juan Ignacio, you graduated last year. Uh, if I'm not wrong, so you really just after graduation, you're already working for DCAF. Uh, what's your role there at the DCAF? One of these mysterious, uh, let's say, at least uh, it's not so mysterious, but think tanks who, which are also no, in the surroundings of the Graduate Institute. Can you explain to us what your what is your role there? Sure. Um, so, first of all, thank you. For, for the invitation and it's a great pleasure to share the space. And since I'm just also starting this journey in the international cooperation, I am also particularly interested in, in listening to the rest of, of panelists who have uh, quite of a long and, and impressive experience. Uh, for me, I'm, I joined as a project assistant last year uh, at the Latin American and the Caribbean unit of DCAF. Just to explain DCAF, um, works uh, basically on in on two ways they have a big operations department and another big policy and research department so i'm in the first one in in the operation department particularly in charge of uh, implementing projects in uh, everywhere we have really presence in in all continents and with the LAC unit uh, i focus on the project portafolio in Colombia. I was specifically brought up to the team to work on a project uh, related to media oversight of the security sector in Colombia, which I find a, a really fascinating project. It touches a lot upon uh, the right to freedom of, of press, particularly in how, uh, yeah, not only media, also civil society and social leader roles in overseeing the security sector through uh, improved freedom of, of expression and press. And on that, as a project uh, assistant, I'm more uh, at the supporting uh, level um, of ECAF that involves really supporting the whole project management cycle, uh, beginning with the whole conceptualization and design phases of a project, uh, including country assessment, 
drafting concept notes, narrative proposal, developing monitoring and evaluation frameworks, and then of course also on the implementing and monitoring phases of a project, which uh, for me involves keep keeping very close communication with our implementing partners, which are local NGOs in Colombia, but also public officials, particularly the police. And I keep track of developments. I uh, verify that the activities are, are carried out and that we also get some signs of outcome achievements. And I also support the content development of specific activities. And there I feel where I can also input the most as an international lawyer. For instance, recently I contributed to, to develop a training course on the right of freedom of expression for police officers in Colombia. And yeah, uh, to sum up uh, that, but then I, I also agree that um, you start doing a little bit of everything. So also a lot of comms work and administrative work as well. Thank you very much for this first round of the table. Thank you, Paula. <clears throat> Sorry. And, and many thanks to all the panelists. It's an amazing variety of, of experiences of, of different functions. It's really very, very exciting. And it seems like the common trait is we do a bit of everything. Uh, and I think, yes, that's something I share very much. I used to work in international organization where I was supposed to have a clear job description. I would do everything but. So, in a way, agility and ability to think on your feet and to pivot quickly in different directions seem really to be uh, a common a common trait that I really share. So, um, in this sense, so the the audience these these events are largely for our students that can see what the alumni are doing, uh, how they, uh, their the path, their careers have developed once they left the Institute. So in a, in a way to give a, a sense of the wealth of the, of the activities, the function, the professional path that our alumni have taken. And so I would like to ask as a second question, um, Two things. First of all, and some of you have already partially responded, so feel free not to repeat what you have already said. But basically, uh, your fellow students are thinking, okay, I'm, I'm taking my master, I'm taking my PhD, and then what? And so, what did you do after you left the institute? How <clears throat> did you uh, get into the place where you are now? Which steps do you take? Some of you, like, uh, uh, like Juan Ignacio uh, did pretty quickly, other uh, took sort of intermediate steps just to get a sense of uh, what happened to you after you left the Institute. And I would like to add also add, uh, and it's not in a way to, uh, to, 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 to seek praises for the Institute, but did you think, do you think that having studied at the Institute has helped you? Uh, either because of the branding of the Institute or the particular uh, courses that you that you took, particular interaction with students. So what did it mean for you in your professional path to have come from the Graduate Institute? So why don't we uh, do the, the reverse order this time? And I would like, uh, I would ask uh, Juan Ignacio to go first. Sure. Um, so uh, I started working at DCAF as an intern while I was fulfilling my master. If I'm not wrong, it was, uh, I did quite a long internship for, for one entire year. I joined uh, on my second semester. Um, I was very excited, but I wasn't quite sure what to expect since all my previous experiences, I used to work um, in Ecuador before for roughly three years, but more on, on very legal positions, actually as a legal advisor and attorney. So I knew this was going to be something completely new, working um, uh, on, on the field of international uh, cooperation, but at the same same time, I saw it as a, a very good opportunity to expand my skills in other areas and also to combine those legal skills that, that I felt already quite confident about with with other types of skills that I thought would help me uh, in my in my career, and it turned out to be a very good uh, experience. Um, as an intern, of course, you do a lot of 
administrative work, which probably is not the most exciting thing. But you also have the chance to contribute a lot on, on research on very interesting topics on, on security, which is something that already interested me before. And uh, uh, to collaborate on drafting uh, a lot of knowledge pro products, also papers, training material. And there I felt that, yeah, I was also, I, I felt that I was contributing or adding up to the team since I am the only only lawyer also in the unit. And yeah, I feel I was giving kind of different or, or uh, add-ups and inputs to, to, to those kind of works. And I think that helped me a lot to later, first to keep extending my internship because it started as something very short. And then once I graduated to, to integrate the team as, as a staff member. And with the, regards to your uh, last question, uh, Gianluca, also, I feel that the Institute uh, was very important first uh, to, to join the Institute um, in the first place. I feel the CAF and, and the Graduate Institute have also a very close relationship. They share the house, so uh, they already know a lot, and there are a lot of staff members in the CAF that are alumni from the Institute, so uh, the, the Institute does indeed have a very good reputation. And also it's widely known this um, also interdisciplinary background that you get from there, which is quite useful for international cooperation. So I leave it at that. Thank you. And indeed, I mean, also the, the fact of sharing almost physically the space uh, can help yes. sometimes. You get to know the people and so on. And that to me is one of the of the great assets of the Institute being really in the middle of international Geneva. Within 300 meters, you have 12 international organizations, NGOs, think tanks, and so on. But again, this is not a marketing pitch for the Institute, but uh, it's a personal consideration. Uh, Georgia, over to you. Thank you. Um, so, um, to start, so what happened after actually? It was Sea-Watch who found me, I have to say. So my, it was quite a quick uh, jump uh, from the Institute, from Geneva to Lampedusa. Um, I actually have a, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a bit of an anecdote, actually. <laughs> uh, the day I submitted my thesis was the 15th of June, and I, I left, uh, uh, I, I went to celebrate with the other students uh, by the lake, and then I just uh, came across uh, um uh, the the this information about this these ngos that were starting um search and rescue operations at sea and a colleague uh, from uh, the course on migration law she told me that uh, she knew that i was writing my thesis on um interception and rescue at sea and the uh, international legal framework uh, uh, um, applicable to uh, to this uh, to this specific Activity and then she she just told me, okay, you know, there is this uh, there is this new NGO. They're they're going to check what's happening in the med. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, I, I actually want to do some volunteering this summer, and then I think I will go back to Geneva, try and uh, find um, a job with the UN or uh, something like that. Uh, so I I just got in touch, and then uh, a couple of days later. I put all my stuff in a bag and moved to this tiny rock in the middle of nowhere between uh, Africa and Europe uh, called Lampedusa. Uh, so I literally moved there and uh, started as a volunteer. Um, I was actually working uh, at, uh, um, at a bar at night <laughs> to, <laughs> to sustain myself. And during the day, I was uh, advising uh, on uh, the first uh, operations at sea of this uh, of this NGO and connecting with the uh, with the Coast Guard, starting to interact with the authorities. It was also the time in which, uh, uh, in general, the civil presence at sea started as a new phenomenon. Um, and then I I, I never left uh, basically. And uh, when it comes to um, how the uh, the master in international law graduate institute has been useful for me uh, well uh, i have to say that i would have never thought that i that even today i would have still looked for information in 
in, in my thesis to, uh, for example, look at the definition of distress and uh, at sea and, uh, and how actually a lot of the information there is still very, very useful and very, um, uh, I'm, I'm still, I'm still using it. I'm still, I'm still looking at it. And I, I actually, I have to say, I did not believe so when I was writing my thesis. I have to be honest. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very happy about that actually because I ended up doing exactly what uh, what I decided to focus uh, my um, my attention on when it comes to the the huge uh, variety of of topics and uh, uh, branches of the law that you can explore. And I'm also very, very happy to see that today there is a, also a course in international law of the sea and to see that the Graduate Institute itself understood the importance of introducing also this, uh, this, this subject, um, where indeed I hope I will be able to contribute uh, next, uh, next year. Um, and uh, I have to say as well that it's been very nice to feel and hear the support from uh, uh, people working at the, at the institute in different capacities, colleagues and professors, um, when it comes to the activity that we try to do at CS NGO, and we did not give that for granted because it's, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, uh, there is a lot of hostility around it uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, issues when it comes to um, how it relates to the overall uh, European uh, policy around migration. So I have to say that in this regard. It's great to have the support of the Institute, and this is also the reason why I'm very happy to liaise back and would love to, uh, to, to, to contribute and bring back uh, uh, some of uh, my uh, experience. Thank you. Great. So it's good to hear that you're still using your thesis, which is not common to many students. I stopped using it right away. And, I'm not uh, saying it's a good thesis. Eh? I'm, not th I'm, sorry, I'm not saying it's necessarily a good thesis, but it's just practical, apparently. It was useful. I mean, that's a, definitely a big compliment to yourself. Excellent. So, um, Christophe, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so, I, it's a bit uh, also, uh, uh, strange for me how it happened because the I was in the second year of the master. I just started the second year of the master. When I decided to do uh, the my master's dissertation on the right to food, and uh, with Andrew Clapham, um, and that's when Andrew Clapham told me that uh, the new special rapporteur of the UN on the right to food, uh, who was that time uh, Jean Ziegler from Switzerland, was looking for a team, and um, so he so he told me you have to call him and you have to meet with him, and so what I did, and uh, and so I started to work with Ziegler uh, in November 2001. Uh, and I worked for 12 years in total with him. Uh, so uh, I finished my master dissertation on the right to food and, and uh, I had the job for, for eight years at 6%. So I, I did a PhD, <laughs> which was not uh, really uh, the, the objective of my career at the, at, the, at the university or the academy or the institute. But anyway, so I did the PhD uh, on the right to food and access to justice. Um, in parallel, also with Andrew Clapham, and so with Ziegler, we did uh, many, many country visits in the in many parts of the world. I wrote uh, so many reports for the UN and 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 work a lot with NGOs and social movements. And uh, and then uh, the the academy was created 2007, 2008, and Andrew Clapham was the first director. So when I ended the the, the PhD, 2008, uh, I was. Uh, Lucky that he, he asked me if I want to join the academy. So I, since 2008, uh, 12 years, 13 years already, I'm at the academy, and so I'm working on economic and social rights, not only the right to food. Um, I'm also in, uh, in in some NGOs. Uh, so in the last 10 years, I've been involved with NGOs, uh, doing, for example, parallel reports to treaty bodies uh, when the Switzerland is examined before the Committee on Economic and Social Rights, for example. Uh, uh, we've also done a, a report in Geneva because we have, uh, I don't know if you know, but in Switzerland, we have a constitution in every canton. And so I was in the Constitutional Assembly in uh, 2012, writing the constitution. And there are lots of economic and social rights in the constitution. And, uh, and so we did a, a, a report on the uh, evaluation of the, how the human rights are, are realized in Geneva. And so we did that with uh, 20 NGOs and and social movements in Geneva. So that was also a very good exercise. And now we are in the process of uh, including the right food in the constitution of Geneva. 
So we work with the parliament, uh, it's always like, almost accepted, but then it will be a vote of the population of Geneva, so we'll see. Uh, and the idea is to really push for to have a, a real policy on, on food in Geneva and not, uh, yeah, not only social assistance or, or food assistance, but really something uh, quite, uh, quite uh, good. Uh, I must say to, to end that, that uh, we just, uh, I have a friend who is called uh, Charles Heller and he created uh, Watch the Med uh, 10 years ago. And, um, and it was a, it was a, a research project uh, founded partly by the National Fund for Scientific Research. And it ended the research. So we just created uh, six months ago, an NGO based in Geneva called uh, Border Forensic. And so we will work uh, uh, on, uh, I mean, I'm just in the committee, as you understood, I'm not an expert on migration and on the, 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 the rescue uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, but, uh, but the, the idea is to, is to work from Geneva and uh, with Geneva Canton and with the Swiss government and, um, and to, so to work on those, all these kind of issues. Uh, uh, so if you are, uh, Paula, I can also put in contact with you with the, these people that are in Geneva and that are, working on that uh, since uh, 10 years, I believe. Thank you. So also a huge variety of things. And I like uh, very much the, what you're doing with the Canton of Geneva. So that's a testimony of how uh, human rights should really penetrate, trickle down. Now we mean something abstract at the international level. Uh, I live in Gran Sacone, so I guess I won't have a chance to, 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 to vote on the referendum, but I'll definitely lobby for that. Oh, okay. no, I said the canton. You are, you are in the canton. Canton, a canton. Okay, then you can count on my vote. Okay. <laughs> Kimena, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so, actually, my career path started when I was doing my master's. Um, so, when I, was, when I did my master's, I was set on the idea of working on human rights. Um, so after my first semester, which was the time that I gave myself to adjust to the workload and the exigencies of the masters, I started interning for the Bolivian permanent mission. Um, and I participated in several human rights council sessions, as well as supported some legal work um, required for the adoption of the Declaration of the Rights and Peasants um, and other people working in rural areas. So I am acquainted with the work that uh, Christophe has been doing uh, and I have been supporting with the Bolivian permanent mission as Bolivia was basically the one, the state that was um, responsible for carrying this through. But I quickly noticed that the human rights field was quite politicized too much for me and I knew that I did not want to work solely on human rights and um, so that is when I took Andrew Clapham's course by the second, third semester on the laws of war. And this is basically my first exposure to international humanitarian law as I did. I studied law in Bolivia. We do not have these type of courses over there. We, we were given 30 minute session from an ICRC delegate from Peru, but that is all we got. Um, and I was quite interested. It was not after I took the course, uh, Andrew Clapham's course on the laws of war, I became fascinated with this branch of law. Um, but unfortunately, the Graduate Institute, it did not offer any more courses on this specific branch. Um, so I started looking into the Geneva Academy because you have that option of taking some courses at the Geneva Academy. And that is when I found Anisa Belal's course on armed groups and international law. The only problem was that it was in French and my French was still close to basic by the by the third semester. But I decided to take the risk and I took the course and I just was fascinated from what I understood. And um, and Anissa had spoken about uh, the organization Geneva Call, seeing as it's an organization specifically focused on engaging armed non-state actors. And uh, I quickly contacted her after the course had ended and mentioned that I would really like to, to intern in the organization and get to know the organization a bit better. So she told me to keep an, a close eye on the internship offers online. And um, I actually found two and I applied to both, one within the legal division and the other within the Europe and Asia region. Um, so it was not until the fourth semester, which is the thesis writing semester for me, which I thankfully you know, had the supervision of, of Paola um, as well as Anissa, 
um, I decided to apply and I got the internship for the Eurasia unit. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they, they selected me and it was from there, everything moved on so quickly. I mean, I was overwhelmed with work, do not get me wrong. I was doing my thesis. I was trying to be as proactive as possible with, with Professor Gaeta, as well as, you know, managing with all my internship responsibilities. And for the first time in Geneva Calls history, they decided to send an intern to the field as, you know, we required support in the field. So right when I finished my thesis before time, I was sent to, to Myanmar. And that's where I had, you know, firsthand exposure to, to the type of work that we do, trainings in the ground, engagement with armed groups. And it was a whole nother world for me. So I, I quickly noticed that I had found my passion and uh, I guess my boss liked my work because um, the day that I was get, basically getting my, my uh, graduation certificate, the graduation day, I signed my contract. Um, so it was my first, you know, big job as a desk officer. And uh, from then on, you know, it's just been, you know, reaching up and up, aiming high and high, and uh, never afraid of the type of responsibilities that they have given me. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, working in the NGO has definitely given me the opportunity for, to hold great responsibility at a very early stage in my career. Um, and I would have it no other way, but uh, without, you know, the Graduate Institute and the Geneva Academy, this would have not been possible. So. If you ask me, you know, on if the Graduate Institute had supported, you know, where I am, definitely it has. It has worked for, you know, basically as, as a sounding board, a jumping board, to move from one place to the other. And I think that the knowledge that I gained throughout my courses, as well as working on my thesis, keeps on supporting me as I will now probably be working on the topic of my thesis, the topic that I wrote with, with Professor Gaeta and support the organization in potential expansions. So um, if you ask me if it has, it has definitely supported me um, and it has definitely taught me how to adapt and be as flexible as possible uh, to whatever the needs of the organization, but also as, as well as you know challenges to, to struggle your work-life balance. Um, but um, no, I mean, I definitely this has been uh, my career started at the Graduate Institute, thankfully, and uh, I would not have it any other way. Excellent. So if you need the marketing pitch, you're the best, uh, best testimonial. No, it's great because uh, in a way to be able to use your thesis, you're actually uh, practicing what you studied. This is such a privilege. And Georgia said the same, no, more or less, your thesis is not something you put in a drawer, but you keep using it as a tool for your work. And also, as you said, the uh, the fact that we had the academy. Sorry? Who started with his thesis? Yeah, of course, of course. Of course, of course. And also, it's interesting how some of you really started a career during the studies. It was not like the separation. First, I study and then I look for a job. It, like one thing uh, really was was uh, facilitated by by your study. So that, that's quite, quite interesting. OK, last but not least, Lisbeth, over to you. Yeah, at the uh, at the risk of um, well, not sounding repetitive because of course all the the, the paths are somewhat different, um, but I can uh, certainly see, and it's really interesting to to hear these stories that uh, at some point during uh, the studies at the Graduate Institute, also for me, there is a uh, some anecdote that happens or just something that have been the thesis um for myself it was uh, actually i i graduated in uh, the development uh, department um with a focus on uh, on environment but when i when i started uh, the studies in geneva i was convinced i was going to to do something with humanitarian aid and and, and i was going to enter that sector that was like the idea i had when i when i moved to to geneva but then in already in the first year, um, what happened is I got in touch with a few trade law students um, who um, let me participate and eventually sign up for the, the ELSA moot court uh, in uh, trade law, uh, which was at the time uh, taught by uh, Professor Paulen uh, by Joost. And um, yeah, we got off on an adventure there uh, on the moot court. And so 
I knew to be grew an interest in uh, trade and investment law uh, and environmental law. So I started to take a lot of legal courses and complementing that actually with the development studies uh, made that an, a very rich uh, experience, both on, on the substance uh, as well as a growing uh, network with uh, lawyers uh, and people studying development, which for me was an extremely rich uh, experience. And I think it's very much true, uh, just that simple anecdote of participating uh, in, in that moot court that I found my first internship during the studies as well. Um, in a quite random way, at some point, there was a request from ISD, the organization where I'm working now, to do a little bit research, uh, of research on fossil fuel subsidies in relation to um, the subsidies agreement at the WTO, and we were just discussing that in class, I think, at the moment, uh, and we were looking at it for the moot court case, and I sent an email to the, the head at ISE saying, I'm doing a little bit of research on that, and probably also for my master's thesis at the Institute, so if you need someone who you need to, um, yeah, who needs to help you with some research, I'd be happy to do so, and uh, that's that's actually how these things started rolling uh, for me. And after that piece of research at ISD, um, uh, there was no funding at the time at the organization to stay on. But in the meantime, um, ISD sits at the International Environment House in, uh, in Chatelaine. And uh, thankfully, we could uh, work from the offices there. We had a common cafeteria with some of the other organizations in town. And that's how I got in touch with, uh, with UNEP, who has a division on trade and environment, which was even more in my interest uh, than, uh, than anything. And so I started uh, working with, with UNEP as a, as a consultant, worked there for a year. Um, but also stayed in touch with, uh, with ISD and then uh, as coincidences sometimes happen, there was a vacancy to start working on sustainable public procurement, um, which was a different topic for me at the time. But I think one of the things that has really helped me throughout the career, and is something that I definitely learned at the Graduate Institute as well, is uh, look for, be open to the opportunities that uh, almost they will come to you, don't worry. And in that moment, just take the risk to learn something new. I think that's what I did at the Institute and that's what I've been keeping to, to do throughout. And that has helped me, I think, to be able to jump from um, the one issue uh, to the other, which I think in our area, in the area of think tanks, is really important to be able to not only see the bigger picture, but also to, to accelerate when some of the issues become uh, really important uh, and to be able to, to support the organizations where we work, uh, to bring those issues then more to the forefront. And of course, with the, the skills, I think, that we were taught at the Institute in terms of research and the, the depth of the issues there, you have the skill sets with you to, to be able to do that, I think. And uh, that's what, what made it extremely helpful for me to be able to, to jump from trade and environments to, uh, to procurement to now policies and, and laws around uh, infrastructure. So it was a very rich trip so far, uh, and I'm sure uh, it will be in the future as well. Thank you, Lisbeth. It's such a pleasure to hear uh, how successful our students are but they manage to seize the opportunities to be ready to adapt and they do it during their studies and they it's really such a rewarding for a professor no it's such so rewarding the look for us as professors i'm sure our colleagues will feel the same i mean because we lose you in a way when you graduate we don't know what happens to you and from with some of you we stay in touch with many of you we don't it's such a pity. And I've told one student uh, yesterday at the end of a course that we love to hear from you, to see what you're doing, to, 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 know, to know what the, how successful you are, but also to know whether or not, I mean, sometimes also to say, hello, professor, or hello, Paul, I'm here. Uh, I don't know, I've got married or I have children or whatever, because I mean, it's something that we, 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 we see you going and that's, it's a pity, but it's so rewarding for us. 
to hear that you are so successful. So I think it's now it's the time to give the floor to the, the students who are with us uh, for question and answers. Uh, so you can put your camera on, it would be no harm. It would be such a pleasure if you can show your face. Uh, so I invite you to do so and also to, that's up to you now. You can take the floor, raise your hand and then uh, ask your questions. Or put it in the chat if you prefer, but we'd, we'd like to hear from you personally. Segolen con, con, con the, the discussing with Lilian whether or not to ask a question. You have the right to two questions since you are two people. We, we don't hear you. While Lilian really... and Segolen fix the problem, perhaps so someone yeah. else has a question. Lilo, Victoria, and the others, why don't you put your camera on? I guess they're underdressed. That's a typical Zoom problem. So. <laughs> Can you hear us now? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so um, we uh, we have a shared question, which was we were both stressing a little bit while we were hearing the um, what people were saying about this. So we're currently in the process of picking our master's thesis topics, and given that all well, a lot of you have ended up working on the topic that you picked up for your master's thesis, it suddenly feels like much higher stakes. And um, we both feel a little bit like maybe we'll never be able to pick a thesis if this is the sort of stakes at risk. Um, so we're wondering if you could say a little bit about how you picked that master's thesis topic and the process that you went through to to arrive at that topic um, and whether that was sort of a, a, you know, a plan that you intended to work in that field or happened to be coincidence. Before Gianluca, you moderated this, this question, may I say something in this, re in this respect? Just yesterday, I was or today, I was discussing with one of the students uh, for, the, for, the, for the topic of the thesis. Uh, and my first question is, what do you how do you see yourself in the next future? What do you want to become? So the selection of the topic for me is always guided to a sort of projection of the career path of the student, which remains very important um, because the master thesis could be mm, a guide towards the first path in career. That's my view. Yeah, I also have my views, but I would like to hear from the from the panelist. Anybody would like to start? Maybe Christoph, yeah? Thanks. No, I, I would disagree with Paula. <laughs> no, no, I think I think it's too much pressure. You don't have to think that uh, you will work on that your whole life or you have to plan a, a career when you do your you choose your dissertation. I think it's just it's the reverse. It's the fact that you love a subject that will make you uh, do a good um, a yeah. good master's thesis or PhD thesis, and then it will because you love the subject, you know the actors, and you will it will you will end working uh, on that subject. But that, but it's not. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I I think that it's better to 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 do what you what you like. Uh, so for example, I started the the the, the institute because I wanted to be uh, working for the ICRC, um, <laughs> which was not effective as as you can see, not successful because they're not working for the SRC. But the and then I was saying, uh, you know, I, I, I have done too much humanitarian law. I want to be a I want to do more a bit more of human rights. And so I did my 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 uh, my master's uh, dissertation and then PhD on the right to food. And so I now I'm working since since 20 years on the right to food and I forgot a bit international humanitarian law. But uh, but uh, anyway the the 
yeah, I think that it's because you love the topic that you will uh, you will find a job in uh, in the same area. But it's it's not the reverse, and that's too much pressure. Well, to, but I was suggesting exactly it. this, Christoph, that <laughs> you have to start with what you love, what you want, okay. to have, what you feel inside as a passion, rather than speculating about what is right, what is strategically good. Because if one thinks in this way, calculating. Uh, uh, it's difficult then to proceed. Is exactly what you say, Christoph. What you want to become, uh, what you, what are your dreams, what you're passionate about, is very important. Yeah, I was thinking exactly the same. Uh, being too tactical, frankly, I don't think uh, it's risky. Uh, follow your passion, and then your heart makes you such so much more credible. Actually, anybody else wants to? Any of the panelists wants to? Yes, Lisbeth. Yeah, just just very briefly, um, we all know, uh, and I I think even I, I graduated in 2013, I remember the stress that you are in when you have to choose a topic for a thesis. It can sound like very daunting. Um, I, I remember that as well. Um, try to worry as least as possible. It's going to be fine. No matter what you will be writing on, it will be fine. But I fully and wholeheartedly agree with what Christoph mentioned. Write about something that you like because you're gonna have you're gonna be stuck with it for like a, a while. <laughs> and, and so I think you you want to just write about something that you find interesting, something something that keeps you up at night, something that you wake up with in the morning. That's and and don't try to think too much. On, on that long term, what will then happen afterwards? Something will happen and it will be okay. And if it's not related to your thesis, it will also be okay. So just just focus on something that you like. Also, Lisbeth, I think you said something uh, important that it's not just a topic, it's the methodology, it's the way of thinking, it's the, the frame that you bring to, uh, to a profession uh, that makes you interesting for a, for an employer and makes you also able to pivot more quickly between yes. topics. So that the choice of your thesis is is interesting, but like Christoph said, it's not like a like a life or death issue. You shouldn't be too stressed and definitely follow follow your passion. Anybody, any other panelists want to? Otherwise, we can uh, see if there are other questions. Yes, Lilo, please go ahead. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Professor Gaeta and Professor Birchi for your time and our panelists. Um, this is very reassuring to hear, especially in the times of exams and uh, jobs hunting. Uh, my question is about how does one find balance between humility and ambition? Most of us come directly from bachelor's to do master. Some of us have four years of experience um, in the field or what some refer to as field, but for most of us it's home. And how does one then transition to after or during the um, studies to a job, which also takes into account your previous experience, but also doesn't put you into the intern box? Um, I, I'm, I'm struggling with this. I, I wonder if there are professors, if you have any insight or our panelists. Thank you. That's such an interesting question. Uh, pride and humility, how do you balance them? Who wants to? Who wants to go first? Georgia, may I see what you think about it? And she just froze. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, thank you for calling me out on this one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was, uh, it's not an easy one to, to, to give an answer to. Um, so I will, I will, I will actually, okay. When it comes to me, I have to say that I had to make, I observed a, a quite interesting transition. I have to say that during my studies, I felt very insecure and I, I had the feeling that I was not, uh, uh, amongst the most brilliant students and that I did not really have any valuable research, uh, skill. And uh, that, uh, yeah, I, I was, I have to say, I was very insecure, probably maybe a little bit too humble uh, back then. Um, and then actually, when I saw that the things I learned and the path I did helped me so much 
um, and gave me a lot of strength when then I was at sea and uh, taking part to rescue operations and knowing that whatever we did there was backed up by a very solid legal framework. This is, as of today, the only one, international law as of today, <laughs> is the only one thing that keeps us going as a civil society at sea. And uh, there has been uh, several, uh, over 20 criminal investigations open against uh, individual members of NGOs for very serious crimes, including facilitating illegal migration and being part of a criminal associations. Um, this means up to 30 years of jail. And amongst my friends and colleagues, over 30 people at the moment are under investigation. And so far, none of these investigations have brought to anything specifically because there is a, a very, very solid um, uh, international legal framework backing our operations, which is uh, also uh, which is absorbed in uh, uh, in the Italian in the Italian legal framework. And uh, this is uh, how this relates to uh, uh, connect, connecting, uh, being humble, uh, like pride and ambition, being humble and being ambitious. I have to say that what, um, what for me was something that at the beginning I was very insecure about, asking myself every day, Georgia, do you really have that much to do with international law? Like, is this really your place? Actually, to, in the moment I left, uh, I, I mean, maybe this is not very, Nice to say, but in the moment I left uh, the uh, strictly uh, academic um, field and I went to the actual field, that background is specifically what supported me and what made me very proud and <laughs> much less humble and uh, um, able to talk uh, in front of any stakeholder, whether that is a ministry, whether that is whoever, um, based on things I've seen and things I've studied. Um, so for me, it was it was a, a quite a shift, and uh, yeah. And today, I'm actually at the point where I have to uh, uh, bite, uh, yeah, where I have to to to, to try and, and and control myself because I I'm uh, I have the I, I have the wish to be uh, outspoken and to be uh, and to 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 share uh, what uh, what I've done. And it was not this uh, this way when I when I started. So. Um, I'm not sure this answers the questions at all, but since I was uh, called by Professor Burti on this, this is what I can share from my side. Well, it's good to see your experience and you do a, a very special job in a way. It's a mix of really uh, hands-on operational activities, advocacy, representation. Uh, so it's a particular exposure out there where you had to measure yourself. Um, Anybody else? I find very interesting this, uh, this, this, this question. They wants to bring their own experience. Juan, perhaps you, you, you wanted to say something in this respect. Yes, for, for me, it was, I, I, I feel very related to the question actually, uh, because for me, it was also a big shift uh, joining DCAF. I was, I, I was working for exactly four years, as you said, uh, Lila, and I was working, uh, as a lawyer, basically, and mostly on criminal law and constitutional law, but really doing this very domestic law type of work. And that was really my comfort zone. And during four years, you kind of make a lot of progress there and you feel already part of an environment. But I still wanted to do my master's and I really was very passionate about international law. So I put that on hold and made my journey to, to Geneva. And here, at first, I took it as, a, as an internship opportunity, as a learning opportunity to, to gain some new skills. And of course, it was hard because after, after, being, after making already a lot of progress as a lawyer, you start from the bottom uh, as an intern. And you end up doing things that you, you weren't doing for a long time, maybe some, a lot of maybe some paperwork, administrative work, translations. Um, and there you really have to be humble if, if you want to, um, if you want to also then be ambitious in the things you really can input and then show your added value and what, what you can bring up from this previous experience you had. So my, my advice is 
accept yeah you have to accept with with uh, with yeah you have to, you have to accept maybe those tasks where you are not so excited about and then really on those tasks where you feel strong and where you really feel you can uh, show and, and bring all your previous experience and and make a difference uh, there you have the opportunity to be ambitious and really ambitious even if you are an intern and i think that later pays pays off and and i yeah i i, I think that's my, my that was my experience yeah. thank you and i wonder whether it's also the kind of job uh that's why i asked georgia first uh, I mean, you are yourself, you bring your mix of insecurity, of ambition, of who you are. But for example, I was for many years legal advisor on international organizations. And there you're really part of it. First of all, you're part of a machine. You're not on your own. And second, you're constantly challenged. And so you have this mix of, am I doing the right thing with, well, I know more than you. So at least I have the, 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 the buffer of security that also comes from what I studied. Uh, and what what I grew professionally in. So it's, 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 it's an interesting and difficult balance in a way. Any other panelists would like to? Gianluca, um, so maybe mine will be more of a, a maybe a dual, um, not, um, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I definitely think that if Romina is still connected, um, she did an internship with us and it would be very interesting to learn her experience as being a lawyer with so many years of experience in the working fora and still open for an internship at Geneva Call uh, in Argentina. So if we could hear from her, that would be excellent. From my side, um, I remember that I had this conversation uh, with my uh, fellow uh, graduate institute um, colleagues, and it was always, you know, the fact that we never thought we were good enough for these positions that looked like they were so much responsibility and we would have no chance at all. But I think, you know, we need to keep an open mind, think outside of the box, do not be afraid, you know, of the positions and the, the responsibilities that they entail. You're up for that and you're up for even more. Uh, most times and not a lot of, you know, um, colleagues will let you know once you enter an organization, but a lot of the learning is done on the job. You learn on the job and uh, as long as you have you know, a basic background um, and knowledge and the willingness to work on that specific area and you dedicate yourself, I think you should be fine. Do not ever, you know, uh, set imaginary limits for yourself and aim high. Um, however, you know, having way too much expectations uh, may be sometimes problematic as they're perhaps not as realistic um, when you are graduating. But and I also consider, you know, the, the economic impact that this can have, you know, settling for an internship that is non paid in Geneva is problematic for students. Um, so also there's also that aspect to consider. But um, something that I would really, really stress is that if you do not consider that you, you know, it's always good to hear from other people. If you can reach out to someone within the organization where you want to work in. I have gotten requests from people in LinkedIn wanting to meet because they're interested in the organization. There's people willing to sit down with you and tell you what it entails and what you need to do in order to reach that level. Um, so feel free to reach out. Do not be afraid. Expand your network as most as you can because it is your network that will also support you in, you know, achieving your first job, your internship, etc. So networking is also very important. And if we still have Romina uh, on board, then perhaps maybe a quick intervention from her would be great. Romina, Jimena is putting you on the stop. You, you can't hold back. So it's you. okay, I'm here. Jimena, okay. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you. Uh, well, just I will do a clarification that what Jimena said that uh, she does in Geneva Call is more of what she said. So she's really a passionate and working machine. I always say to, to you that I really admire you because she's amazing and her list is more long than what she said. And so I wanted to say that. And about my experience, uh, some of you, uh, we have already been classmates uh, at the graduate, so most of you know me. 
So I'm coming from Argentina. I work there in a federal criminal court. Uh, and at the same time, I lectured at the University of Buenos Aires. And then I decided that it was time to, to have an international experience because I always wanted to do a master uh, abroad. And for different personal reasons, I couldn't do it when I was much younger than, than now. So finally, I took the decision and said, well, now or never. And finally, I was admitted at the Graduate Institute. And when I arrived here, I said, okay, I want to do everything that uh, I want to take advantage of any opportunity. And one day I saw uh, that Geneva Call was looking for an intern. So I did my application. For me, it was after a lot of years uh, passing through a selection process. I did my exam, then I did my interview, et cetera, blah, blah, and finally, I started doing uh, doing the internship, and it was an amazing opportunity. It was uh, during uh, the first wave of COVID, so it was also new for me to work online, as most of uh, the also for most of the members of the of the team. Uh, but it was a it was a great experience, and so what I would perhaps said uh, say to everyone is. Uh, if you are here, just take the opportunities uh, try not to doubt about yourself. Although some, usually I doubt about myself and I was, I have him in a pushing <laughs> for me in that moment when we were, when I was doing the internship. So I would suggest to all of you to believe in yourself, to take advantage of uh, all the opportunities you have in career services, for example, for adapting your CV, how to improve your, uh, your cover letters, because uh, each uh, organization or each sector has a different way of doing a or presenting a cover letter, etc. So uh, I think that we have the tools at the Graduate Institute to be better prepare, uh, prepared for applying for internships, uh, jobs, etc. So in my case, uh, I did it. I, I had some meetings uh, at career services. I, I assisted to some workshops about networking, how to improve my, my CV, etc. And that helped. So, yeah, that's my, in short, in a few minutes, that's my, my experience here in Geneva since I arrived. Thank you. It's great. A very brave uh, choice, in a way, to take the jump and come back to Geneva and study and so on. So I really admire for that. And you use an expression which I love, passionate working machine. So we should all have it uh, printed on a T-shirt set. <laughs> I really love that thing. Um, is there any other question? Yes, Victoria. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm in the library. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? S speak, speak louder, please. Okay, because I'm in the library. Ah, so okay, okay, sure. okay. We're in your lips then. Okay, uh, I just wanted to know if you could go back, what, what would you do differently in terms of your career path? And maybe how how did you deal with the rejections? Because sometimes this can be very frustrating. And especially when you, I don't know, you're very in love with the topic or something like that, and you don't see that this professionally takes you anywhere at the moment. So these are my two questions. Thanks. Excellent question. I keep asking myself every day what I should have done differently. So <laughs> who would like to go first? Christophe, may I pick on you this time? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, no, it's a bit difficult because, of course, if you change something, then everything change. And uh, so I wouldn't uh, say no to the special reporter or to Clapham um, or to the PhD. Uh, but I think what I is missing, um, I would have loved to have a training to to be uh, to to be able to manage a team of researcher or or, or um, advocacy or because because I think we, we we have the knowledge of international law and human rights law and but uh, but the, but the problem is that that uh, then you are you are in this uh, NGO or academic world of think tank and but you don't have the knowledge on how to to manage a team and um, and so yeah I think that's I would uh, I would have done that I can still do it of course. But uh, it's always a discussion with the academy, and uh, once they said yes, and then they said, oh, we don't have money anymore." Anyway, but th that's uh, yeah, I think that's something that is missing uh, for me, and 
and then uh, yeah i had a team for for six years now and uh, and yeah i don't know I had, even some uh, easy easy tips or tools that we can use uh, would be very helpful can i say something on this i think christophe raises a very good point and it's not only uh, christophe if i may not only learning how to to, 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 to supervise or to manage, let's say, a team when you have a role of responsibilities, but also working in a team. Maybe at the beginning of a career, very important also, no? how to relate with the other members of the team and, and build uh, a constructive environment or including with the person supervising the work, but you, you raise, I mean, a very, very good point, if I may say so. Yeah. Any other view? Any other? Um, also on the question of rejection. Remember, this was mentioned, we had a previous event when somebody asked about rejection, which are a fact of life, but not, not a very easy fact of life. And sometimes we respond so differently and either the thing bumped on us or we, we really feel anguished. and. It's so personal. Ah, uh, yes, sorry, Lisbeth, go ahead. Yeah, both actually excellent uh, questions. Um, let me come in on the, the rejection side. I think we must all remember that the, the rejection is really not about you. It's just has nothing to do with you. Um, there are a lot of applicants when you're applying for internships and there are thousands of reasons uh, why the rejection comes to you and not to someone else. Um, I've been doing quite some recruitment over the past year myself, um, which on the other side is also a very hard task to do, I must admit. And that relates to what Christoph just mentioned. Uh, it's not no availability for proper training uh, in, that, uh, in that field. Um, but it's it's easy to say uh, and it's hard to do to just ignore the rejection um but um i'm, I'm afraid that's that's where it is hang it above the bed that it has nothing to do with you uh, because it really doesn't um and and i see that from from having been on the other side and of recruiting people finding people uh so um never never give up and never forget that um, and uh, Christophe, to your point, I would love to uh, sit together um, and uh, talk about how we can find solutions to this, because I think uh, in this sector, um, as much as in others, but certainly in ours, it is a massive problem that we don't get enough training on uh, management and uh, it's, uh, it's bad for the sector overall. So if there are people out there who want to brainstorm on what to do about it, please write. I would be the first one to take a call with you. Uh, this is something that also relates to um, what happens with uh, interns and how do we value them and how we make people valued in the organization. There is a responsibility of the sector here that has nothing to do with the people who are applying for the jobs and we need to do something about it. Okay, many thanks. I, I think we are like 10 minutes to eight and probably it's a good time to, I can see you are all hypoglycemic at this point and we need some sugar or some, some pasta for the Italians. Uh, so I think we can stop here and I enjoyed this imme immensely. Um, last event was with people from international organization, maybe because that's where I spent my professional career. It was more familiar to me this time. It was really very different. And I hope that also, uh, the, the students that listen in, uh, enjoyed it and learned and very assured also, because I, I think that, um, on question like, uh, humility, insecurity, rejection, that are really part of who we are, but they weigh particularly heavy at the beginning of your career when things seem daunting or so many possible direction, I don't know where to go and so on and so forth. So uh, one of you said at some point things fall into place. That's very true. It doesn't help you when you are at your seventh application and it's turned down. Um, but it certainly happened to me at some point, something clicks and things fall into place. And if you're good and all of you are, 
And also, again, it's not a marketing pitch, but you come from a great institution like the, the Graduate Institute, where you learn the substance. I think you learn personal skills, your methodology that allow you to be agile on your feet, intellectually, professionally. You have all the ammunition and all the credentials to make things fall into place quite, quite quickly. Um, so I think with these great uplifting words, uh, I would like to uh, to finish and and uh, Paola, over to you. Yes, indeed, Gianluca, I share your view that I enjoyed immensely. Thank you very much for participating in this event. I myself got rejected six times before I finally <laughs> got into a PhD program, which was good to me to learn me some humility. I have a tendency to have to be too proud of myself. And then this is also a good reminder that, I mean, you have to face failures and, and one has to cope with these failures to become stronger in a way. And uh, anyway, uh, this is something that I would like to say to our panelists uh, with the students of the um, Master International Law and PhD students, we are trying to organize activities uh, for promoting the department, but some of them would be to try to keep and strengthen our bonds with our alumni, uh, not only for um, these kind of events, advising our students on career paths, but to do more together on topics we like, we love, we're passionate about, organizing conferences, thinking of law clinics, or many other opportunities we just have to to be together and um, not to lose sight of each other and uh, your institute will be always your home so thank you for for joining us today and um, hope to you to see you in person soon and have a good summer thank you very much thank you very much bye bye thank you so much thank bye. you bye bye